Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference channel. My name is Jesse Day, and we're counting down to the next VRIC, January 21st and 22nd. There is a link in the description below where you can get your tickets. But for now, of course, we're bringing the VRIC to you with our series of expert online panels, and we've got another great one lined up for you today. Today, I'm joined by Peter Grandich of Peter Grandich & Company and Michael Gentile of Bastion Asset Management to discuss gold, silver, and the commodities market in general. Gentlemen, it's great to have you on the show. Well, great to be with you, Jesse. Thanks, Jesse. So let's start with the fact that the world is obviously changing at a very rapid pace. And now on top of everything that's been going on, we've seen a new conflict emerge between Israel and Hamas. What are your thoughts on how this conflict might affect financial markets and in particular the commodity space? Peter, I'll start with you. Well, sadly, it's an old conflict. It goes back hundreds of thousands of years. It just has a different spin to it at this point, slightly different. Uh, as we speak, uh, we're on the verge of uh, expecting Israel to not only continue an air attack, but uh, retaliation, but actually go in. And that opens up a potential wider story by the time this adds, because Iran is threatening that if they do that, they're telling their other agents Hezbollah to attack to the north. And there's a whole lot of dynamite that can happen. I think what's changed for me uh, compared to viewing this for the 40 years I've been in around the industry is world opinion. World opinion is almost split. Even here in the U.S., we've done polls where only about 60 percent of Americans are so-called supporting the, the Israeli side of this conflict. And I think that's a huge uh, new consideration that's going to play a role politically because politics will definitely play a major role in this. And so uh, uh, I don't think Israel has the open support that it had from the Western world that it once had. And that's going to, I think, change the way. It'll either make them be more aggressive and try to do it faster and more aggressive, or, or it may bring pause. But it certainly is somewhat different than past conflicts. Yeah, and just to give some context, today is October 16th. So you're right, Peter, by the time this airs, a lot may have changed. Michael, your thoughts on what you see occurring between Israel and Hamas, and if there's any light you could shed on how you could potentially see it affecting the commodity space. Yeah, unfortunately, in our in our job, Jesse, we gotta we gotta look at the financial markets, but I don't want to ignore the human tragedy and the Absolutely. immense suffering that, that both sides are gonna are gonna uh, sustain in the coming weeks and months. And the bigger tragedy if the war expands in scope beyond uh, Israel and Hamas right now. Um, from a financial markets perspective, uh, I would say it's a very fast moving situation, and I think investors need to pay very close attention to the, the escalations that are potentially happening here. If there is an escalation, obviously the most logical market would be the oil market. You probably see a dramatic move if, if Iran decides to intervene either through Hezbollah in Lebanon or, or directly. I think you could see oil prices shoot north of $100 very, very quickly, potentially to $150 a barrel very, very fast if, if Iran's supply is viewed at risk in this conflict. And then the financial markets being already stretched, interest rates being where they are, uh, the markets being a bit rocky the last kind of six to 12 months. I think the financial markets are also vulnerable to additional shocks. Uh, you know, so right now, as P Peter said, this conflict has flared up many times in the last you know, 50 to 100 years and for thousands of years. And the market's kind of view right now is going to stay contained between a skirmish between uh, Israel and Hamas. But if you see any escalation, any new countries getting engaged, any broadening of the conflict, that would be a major net negative for the market. And then keep your eye on commodity markets. So I would say oil would rally strongly. Gold would probably rally very strongly. And then after that, depending on the repercussions of the ripple effects, uh, other commodity markets as well uh, would be would be affected. Uh, food markets like agriculture and others could be also affected. So it's something that investors need to pay very close attention to. And I think the market's been overly calm so far because of past history. Uh, they're they're probably discounting too heavily the fact that it's going to stay a typical conflict between Israel and Hamas. But if it escalates beyond that, uh, we could have some serious repercussions for the markets here. But Jesse, let me just add one thing I think is important: a difference now than ever before. Because of our border, or in my view as an American, a lack of a border, we're already seeing reports of suspicious people that are already considered potential terrorists as being caught. And the question I ask, OK, who didn't we catch and what could change this into something different than the past? 
if we start to see attacks on American soil. I think that would radically change everything, be a huge negative for the financial markets here. We saw uh, when we've had the few terrorist attacks on American soil, how people step back, refuse to go shopping, refuse to go to malls, things of that nature. That's the fly in the ointment, so to speak, that could really change this different than in the past. And because of what's happened with our lack of security, uh, I think there's far more of a danger of that now than there ever has been in the past. Yeah, definitely awful to think about, but something to keep an eye on for sure. I want to switch to the U.S. bond market because we've been seeing ongoing problems there with long duration bonds recently having endured their worst drawdown in history. This certainly seems different from normal market volatility. Does this herald something significant for the economy? Michael, I'll start with you. Yeah, it's very interesting. The, the, I'm, I'm been mainly focused on equities for my 20 plus year career, Jesse, but obviously as an equity investor, you have to follow what the bond market's doing. And for the last 40 years, the bond market's done nothing but have yields go down, which has been a net positive for equities, <laughs> basically for my entire life. <laughs> the bond, yields have only gone down one direction. Uh, you've seen the bond yields break out. You've seen yields go much higher and faster than many investors would have dreamed or guessed uh, two short years ago. But I'd say the last two, three weeks, something's really changed in the bond market. You've seen the 30-year bond start to blow out. You've seen yields continue to rise, Jesse, despite the fact that the inflation data has been cooling. And that, to me, was a big red flag. That's something, you know, obviously, when inflation is running hot, I think rates are way too low. You expect yields to go up. I think you've ha- you saw a failed bond auction on a 30-year bond uh, a couple of days ago, which said the yield spiking. And if you take a step back, obviously, inflation and rates had to go up, right? It was they were suppressed way too low for too long. But if you take a step back on really what's happening here, right? For the last five to 10 years, the Federal Reserve has been buying 50 to 60% of every single bond that's been issued. If you look at the last you know, $20 trillion of issuances, they've now stopped buying bonds. They've also become net sellers of bonds. The other net buyers of bonds historically the last 20, 30 years have been the Chinese and the emerging markets who have been including US dollar stockpiles who have also become net sellers of the bonds. So I saw an interesting post on Twitter or LinkedIn the other day that I found really interesting. If you look at a stock, say one guy or one girl was buying 50 to 60% of every single Apple share that's been issued in the market the last 10 years. And all of a sudden that buyer stops buying shares of Apple. Not only to stop buying shares of Apple, but they start selling their shares of Apple. What do you think the stock is going to do? The stock is going to fall. So you've had the US Fed being the net buyer of bonds, dramatic buyer of bonds, suddenly stop buying, become a net seller. And all the other net buyers as well have stopped buying. So if you have a vacuum of, of no buyers and a massive issuance, Peter and I've talked about this a lot, multiple trillions of dollars of debt being issued per year, you've got a massive supply issue and you've got no buyers. So where do you expect the bonds to go? They're going to go down. So what I've been seeing is decoupling from inflation data just to like pure supply demand dynamics, which we have not seen in the bond market for 20 years because the Fed's been intervening almost every single time. So that's a, that's a scary thing for the US when you start talking about their cost of capital and how they're going to finance these massive deficits. And now these two wars, they're going to try to be funding simultaneously. That's something investors need to keep an eye on beyond inflation data, just who are going to buy all these bond issuances and what rate does it have to offer investors to attract new capital in the bond market. So that's a major development and a, and a new one that I don't think is getting enough airtime uh, in financial markets. And Peter, your thoughts on what's going on in the bond market and particularly now the fact that we're seeing China, Russia, and several other nations selling their U.S. treasuries at the moment. Yeah, I think what really is interesting is if you just go back to earlier this year when they supposedly were working on the uh, debt ceiling and we postponed it as we always do for the 70th or 72 time and extended it, the amount of debt that has been added in that period of time is unprecedented in all of American history. And I think that's another, and everything Michael, I said, absolutely agree with. And when you throw on that factor, we're watching people now realize that even if inflation slows and the economy slows, people are starting to realize that there's a lot of money that needs to be financed. And where's it going to come from for a lot of reasons that Mike, Michael gave? And you, you kind of touched on something, and I don't want to go off on a tangent, but the very fact that in the world today, People don't look at America in the same way they did 20, 30 years ago. That's why the BRIC nations are gaining such momentum and moving out. And America is looking outside, looking in. So those people who might have been participants in our market in a big way, not just bonds, but other markets, but particularly in our credit markets, are not going to be at a time when, as we said, is that the Fed even can no longer do as it used to do and just print and 
by everything in sight. And, and that's why I'm not a believer that even if interest rates stop going up a lot, that we're going to get this don't worry, be happy crowd Wall Street mentality going to reverse. We're going to flood the market again and easy money's here again. And one other caveat in that that isn't getting a lot of attention. We must remember that in the pandemic, when the Fed stepped in with trillions of dollars, they funded a lot of zombie companies, companies that obviously were on the brink. Those companies have to be coming back to the market now, including people in the real estate market at all, in a totally different type of borrowing market. And that too is going to add pressure. So the bond market is not the safety, sure place to be as it once was. And that's one of the reasons why, and I don't want to skip to if you have other questions about it, one of the reasons why I think gold is rebounded because it's starting to take some of that safety issue that used to go strictly into treasuries is finding its way into the gold market. Well, I definitely want to talk about gold, but you brought up the BRICS nation. So I have to delve a little bit deeper there, Peter. I know you've been discussing this in other recent interviews you've been doing as well. How much do you think the BRICS alliance and they're adding new members now, BRICS Plus, um, and of course, many other countries have voiced their desire to join. How much of a threat do you think it poses to the U.S. hegemony? And do you think we could see them create some sort of alternate currency for trade in the years ahead? And Peter, I'll go to you first on this one. Well, I'll give a simple answer and Michael can give a more detailed answer because he follows it every bit as much as us. It's one of the things he and I discuss quite often. But the way I've described it is I really believe this in my heart, Jesse, that the next one to three years, the movement into the BRICS and what they're going to do in a various different ways is going to rival how the industrial revolution impact trade in the world. Only this time, America is going to be outside looking in. When Saudi Arabia basically said to the United States, we're done with the petrodollar, we're willing to entertain and talk to people about selling our oil and doing type of deals, not exclusively using the U.S. dollar. That was the beginning of the end. It didn't get a lot of press because the don't worry, be happy crowd on Wall Street knows that really is a death blow. So I really am a big, big believer that the BRICS, as we get into the next one to three years, are going to be more and more of a story for our financial markets and more of a negative for America as we move forward. And Michael, your thoughts on the impact the BRICS nations could have moving forward? Yeah, I think you're already seeing it in real time, Jesse. I think the financial media is overly obsessed about if and when the BRICS come out with their new reserve currency to compete with the U.S. dollar. The reality is, look what they're doing with their with their money, as Peter just mentioned, right? They are selling U.S. treasuries. They're clearly buying gold. Look at the data. Central bank buying the last six quarters, a massive swing of physical gold heading east versus west. They are trying to settle their oil purchase contracts and currencies other than the U.S. dollar. So what if they start the reserve currency next week or in 10 years? They're doing everything that would set up a precursor to that in the future, which is undermining the U.S. dollar, undermining the usage of the U.S. dollar and diverting uh, dollars towards physical assets like gold or trade in their own currency. So that already was spoken earlier. That's already having an impact on the U.S. bond market. You talked about financial hegemony. What the Americans need to understand is they live the last 50, 60 years with the reserve currency, offered them a fantastic quality of life. It offered them a cost of capital and, and a lifestyle that was only afforded to the country that owns the reserve currency. So very low borrowing costs, ability to print money anytime without impacting the markets. That's slowly being eroded. I'm not say here saying today that 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 the kingship of the U.S. dollar is over now, but it's, it's being eroded at the margins every single week and every single day. And every massive deficit they run, every conflict they enter, every time the deficit blows out even further, the confidence in that U.S. dollar is being eroded. And that just means higher borrowing costs, more inflation, and less uh, a less lucrative life for Americans going forward on a relative basis. So this is a major problem. What's up, guys? Quick break. My name is Jay Martin. I'm the CEO of Cambridge House and the host of the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference. I wanted to quickly point your attention to a link right beneath this video where you can subscribe to our new weekly newsletter. If you want to better understand the minds of the best investors in the resource space, subscribe to this newsletter. I author it personally every Sunday and I love writing it. Hit that link below to subscribe. All right, back to the interview. Let's touch on gold at the moment. It's now back up north of 1900 as of this recording. After enduring a drawdown, obviously gold can be volatile. It might be back down by the time this is released. But what are your thoughts here on gold and the gold mining space? Um, are you exercising caution? Do you think there's opportunity at the moment? And I'd also like to get your thoughts on silver as well. And uh, Michael, I'll go to you first. 
Yeah, I mean, there's a few things there. I would say the U.S. the gold price has been it's still up five percent year to date. Last time I checked, so it's done a pretty good year. You, you can never tell it looking at financial commentary, looking at the stock market that the gold's actually up year to date with the with the boom it's had in the last couple of days. Um, but I would say I'm incredibly bullish on the outlook for gold, and the reason is regardless of what happens in the next three months, six months, to two years, the U.S. is sitting on thirty three and a half trillion dollars of debt, as Peter just mentioned. Right? They're they're running deficits of one to three trillion dollars a year at infinity, basically. The only way to contain a deficit that large, I mean, the interest expense on the U.S. debt is now going to be the single largest expense item above Social Security if you ran a 5 or 6% coupon on the debt, That's which is what the current rates are. So as the debt gets rolled over and refinanced the next three to four years, your largest expense as the government is going to be interest expense. That is simply not sustainable for, for I mean, any country, let alone the largest country, uh, economic country in the world. So you've got a major interest rate problem. You've got a major deficit problem. The only way the U.S. is going to contain that is by suppressing rates at some point in time. So gold has gone down because the uh, interest rate has risen and inflation expectations have come down. So the real interest rate, which is the interest rate on your debt minus inflation expectations, has gone positive. It's gone to about two, two and a half percent from negative uh, last time gold two thousand dollars announced. In the future, the only way you're going to float these deficits and balance your budgets if you if you suppress the rates below a level that inflation is running. So we need we need negative real rates going forward to to fund the excesses in our system. And that's that. Whether it's, that's kicked off by a war, you got to fund. Whether that's kicked off by the bond market revolting in your face, that's kicked off by multi multi trillion dollar deficits by future governments in the future. That's a that's a guarantee to me in my mind. I don't know when that's going to happen, but you're going to have to see yield curve control like we had in Japan, like we had elsewhere, because we cannot afford the interest on our debt, and you can't pay off the debt if you're running deficits. So that's that's the mega trend for gold longer term. Is I think it's a big big back, positive backdrop. When you take a step back and look at the stocks. Peter and I scratch our heads looking at the stock market. You would never guess that gold's trading at $19 an ounce looking at the average small to mid-sized gold company trading in the market. They are beyond despair, despondent, apathy, no ability to raise money. Valuations are probably 30 to 40 year low, especially for the smaller company. So when you have a strong gold price already with a, a tailwind to potential new high gold prices in the future, coupled with major depression slash and just giving up in the gold market in terms of equity investors, that to me is a fantastic setup to be a really strong sector in the years and months ahead. So I'm incredibly bullish on gold. I have the majority of my portfolio invested in gold related equities and, and I'm patiently waiting for company uh, in, in that boat that's pretty empty right now in terms of the gold bull, gold bull boat right now. And your thoughts on silver as well. I mean, silver is a silver is a commodity that always does very, very well. Once the gold bull market gets running, you can look at the gold to silver ratio. Uh, I think once gold makes new, all-time highs, which I'm quite confident it's going to make in the next 12 to 18 months, you're going to see silver do really, really well. And that's typically, silver is the beta. So once gold makes new all-time highs, you expect silver to be up 3 4% on a day where gold's up a percent. Up until now, you've been seeing the smart money, the central banks, uh, those that see the long-term institutions, see the writing on the wall are accumulating gold. But we haven't kicked in the retail crowd yet. We haven't kicked in the speculation crowd yet. Those are the guys and girls typically take silver higher. So again, if you see gold make a new high, I think silver will be really strong performer on the back of that in the next 12, 18 months after that. And Peter, last time we spoke, you said either at present, this is one of the greatest opportunities for gold mining stocks or the bell is rung, the trap door is closed and, and it's never going to be the same again. So at, at this point in time, um, how are you feeling about gold and also silver in terms of the equities? Well, first of all, Michael was very kind to say I was just scratching my head to what's happened to my portfolio in mining shares. That's on a good day. Uh, we learned one thing, I certainly, after 40 years, we used to have an old saying that owning mining shares was like owning gold. That didn't work this past year. I think that's an important thing to take hold of. I, I look at a little bit different how I come to gold because what's left of my life and business is still with a planning group that does financial planning here for U.S. residents. And what I find is astonishing is that even after what happened in 2022 and suddenly people were walking around and seeing they were retired and they were down 30 percent and they were trying to figure out how they were going to pay and they got a little rally in 2023, but now that's turned down again and they're getting worried. When I sit with those people, Jesse, most of their wealth is in some sort of financial asset. And I say to them this, listen, do you have home insurance? Yeah. Well, why do you have it? Well, in case something happens to my home. I say, you have car insurance? Yes. You have health insurance? What insurance do you have in case your financial assets don't work? And remember, people that own stocks used to say, well, my insurance was bonds. And we kind of discussed that that's not the best insurance anymore. They have almost no exposure to gold. 
So all, many of them zero. And then I tell him this, and I always get the same reaction, Jesse. It's really kind of funny still. I say, I want you to consider owning gold and pray to God it doesn't go up. And they look at me and go, why would you want me to buy something that's not going to go up? Because if it does, I can pretty well assure you that your financial assets went down. And some of them think and get to consider it, then they get caught up in the don't worry, be happy philosophy that's prevalent in the least here in the financial service industry in the United States. And But never has it been more an appropriate time to consider it. I think the other thing that we have to understand, I think the big changes for me anyway is, we have to understand there's two markets. There's the paper market, uh, which was dominated until recently, basically between London and New York. That's an important change now. It's moving more and more to the Far East. And we're seeing less of, not gone, but less of the manipulation in the paper market. That's an important part of, of the equation because people in that part of the world have a much better understanding and appreciation of gold uh, than they do. So I'm pretty confident, you know, that we went through a, a normal correction. We have one of the most interesting technical charts I've ever seen in 40 years. We have a cup and handle formation on both gold and silver that goes back 10 years. It's one of the most bullish technical formations you can have because most times from the handle that we're going through now, it breaks to the upside versus the downside. So when I look at all the fundamental things and then I look at the technical, I have to say I'm really bullish. Two quick thoughts, because I know you want me to answer about mining shares. The thing that's changed for Peter Granich about gold is I always used to get in trouble with the silver bugs because I would always tell him I would want to own twice as much gold as I wanted to own silver and that it was in a sense second class. Oh, well, I can't tell you that was as bad as some things you can say, but I do believe now they basically deserve equal attention. Silver's fundamentals have changed dramatically. If you're going to believe all the electrification and the solar and all that kind of stuff. So I pretty well evenly divided there. The one thing I'll just say about mining shares and after suffering losses of 70, 80% in stocks that if you came to me six or 12 months ago, I would have told you bottom step up then. Never has there been evaluations. Now, I won't mention a company because Michael's a board member of it, but I just interviewed their president before we just did this. And he noted basically the company's being priced at about $5 an ounce for their known gold. That is beyond fire sale. That is beyond ridiculous. You have to have the courage to step up and buy anything which in the ground is being valued at five, eight, ten dollars $10. And it's widespread. It's not just limited to the one, one company that Michael's a board member of. And I'll just tell you, that's why getting past these next few weeks, getting through 2023, getting through where most retail people just throw in the towel and just say, I want to start the new year with a clear head. I think as bad as 2023 was, 2024 and beyond is going to be the best junior resource bull market we've ever seen. And we just have to try to survive for the next two to three months to get there. Well, let's talk about some... Oh, Michael, go ahead. I just want to follow through Peter said. I mean, you look at Jesse, typical allocation for investment advisor broker portfolio is a 60-40 portfolio, 60% bonds, 40% equities. If you look at the performance of bonds in the last 12 months, I think it's the worst performance of bonds over a 12-month period in the history of the US bond market. So your bond portfolio, which is supposed to protect you in bad times, has just taken a 25 to 30% drawdown, depending on what maturity curve you're invested in. Your equity portfolio, if you don't own the top seven stocks in America, the Magnificent Seven, they call them, you were down in 2022, and you're probably flat to down this year. So your 60-40 portfolio is, is making you eat significant losses. And we talked about the lack of uh, interest to buy bonds based on the deficit situation, lack of buying and the massive supply. So if you're an investment advisor, and Peter is one of his clients, what are you telling them to buy? Right? You, you, you're a little reluctant to put them in the bond market. The equity market is still quite expensive and, and facing some major headwinds. So we think there's a place for gold that's probably 0.05% of investor portfolios today. If that goes from 0 0.05 to 1%, what the gold price would do would make your head spin it. And it would still be a very low, modest allocation versus his history when you've had prior inflationary periods or periods where you've lost confidence in, in the reserve currency. So there's a lot of room uh, on the bullish side ledger. No one's there. No one's interested. No one's paying attention except the Eastern uh, central banks and Eastern buyers. When the West wakes up to this, it could be quite powerful. Yeah, some very good points there. I want to touch on some other commodities as well and get your thoughts anywhere else among the commodities complex where you're bullish. 
Peter, I'll go to you first. I know last time we spoke, you were quite bullish on uranium. Um, what are your thoughts today? The equities have risen quite a bit since then. And is there any other commodities you've got your eye on at the moment? Uh, well, uranium was an interest because I never got involved with it in any really shape or form throughout my career until about three years ago when I actually heard someone being interviewed and expressing how the turn they were seeing was going to happen because of energy and all. And somebody told me uranium's under $20. I said, are you crazy? Because I remember it being 60, 70, 100. So I looked at it and then I looked at some of the, the companies. And what's really different there is, unlike in most other commodities, there's hundreds of thousands of choices. In the uranium market, for producers anyway, there was very few. So I jumped on board on a company like Camago, which I thought was really the bellwether, and got involved in uranium and, and haven't really felt that we've reached even close to the end of that. We've gone through another correction and consolidation because just about four weeks ago, they were, everybody was shooting the rockets again up on Twitter and all. But uh, it's still the, the fundamental story, I think, Michael can give his opinion. I don't know of a better supply and demand scenario in commodities in my entire career than what looks like for uranium. And in fact, you always get worried when you don't see any fault. But really, other than, a, than some sort of accident, or the world imploding and suddenly we don't need all the energy and needs that everybody thinks. It's hard to see how that is because that's not an industry where ready supply is just sitting and it's been mothballed, but because prices got better, you can go and take it in and bring it back into production. So I still think other than a correction, and I think this correction is more than halfway through, I think there has a way to go. The metal that's attracted me again, and Michael probably knows a lot more about it than I do, but I just think from a price change that's looking interesting again after it just went you know through the through the roof and that's lithium i think something like lithium and then there's other things and and, and michael has a better eye on it and people don't know about this but if you're going to be hot on lithium batteries you also have to have phosphate and people go phosphate that's boring well those are the type of metals that i think we have to try to focus on now, if we're going to believe all the stories, even if they're going to be half true on where the world is going in terms of energy needs. And Michael, your thoughts on uranium, lithium, phosphate, and, and anywhere else you're looking at the moment for opportunity? Yeah, first, I want to say I want to congratulate Peter for his phenomenal call on uranium. I mean, if, if you look at you might think we're both a bunch of crazy guys here talking about how it's going to be an amazing year for gold next year and how well these junior gold equities are going to do. But if you look back to when Peter made his call on uranium, it was 2019. I'm correct if I'm wrong, Peter. Um, maybe it was him and maybe one or two other people on YouTube talking at all about uranium and you couldn't find a friend and the stocks had zero appetite, zero interest. There was not a pulse in that sector. And look how well uranium price and uranium equities have done. So for your viewers that are skeptical on the ability of the gold junior market to revive itself or the gold market to really assert itself as a market leader in 2024. Look no farther than uh, Peter's uranium call three, four years ago to what can happen when the fundamentals and investor attention line up properly. Uh, so that, that's one thing. I would say, you know, I've covered energy, oil and gas for 20 plus years. I've been very, very intimately involved in the mining sector off and on for 20 years, but very intensely the last five years. I'd agree. I would say the overall energy transition, you know, the transition from carbon economy to electric vehicle economy, the politicians like Justin Trudeau, Joe Biden, the European leaders, they go to these fancy conferences and they draw these nice spreadsheets, how they're going to remove carbon from the world in the next 25 years. None of them have any idea how hard it is to mine and how hard it is to bring mines onto production. So if you, I, as a guy who's involved in the mining business, I think those forecasts for lithium, for phosphate, for copper, for nickel, they're all out to lunch. The, the supply from those mines that the governments are projecting are, are nowhere near to true. They're, we're going to be dramatically short on those supply curves. So one of two things has to happen. Either those prices of those commodities have to go significantly higher in order to incentivize more activity. But even if they do, you can't snap your fingers and bring a mine on in two years. You're talking about an eight to 10 year process. So I'm quite bullish on, on the commodities like copper, uh, phosphate, lithium as well. Maybe I pulse the pulse, the pullback here that are going to be required because I think the ability to bring supply is going to be much, much less uh, easy to do than they think. But I'm actually conversely quite bullish on, on oil because I think the oil is going to have a longer life cycle and a longer runway than these politicians think, because they're not going to have their supply of critical metals to uh, to offset and produce the electric vehicles they need. So overall, we're in a bit of a lull right now because the commodities the economy is softening. People are worried about a slowdown, rising rates. But, but you know, copper is definitely one of my favorites because I just think it's it's going to be the the biggest user. Uh, as biggest use is going to be copper and the electrification of the world. And when I look at the supply situation in copper, there, there are just not enough mines ready to come on, and there are no mines that are going to get built at 350 copper. You are going to need five, six, 
$7 copper to even poke these companies, the larger companies, to want to put the billions of dollars of capital needed to build new supply. So quite bullish on copper and that whole food chain downwards, uh, like I said, phosphate, lithium, uh, nickel, they're all going to benefit tremendously from, from what the politicians are trying to push, which is electrification of the grid. Just, I'd like just, to follow. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Peter. I'd just like to add something quickly on oil that, as an American especially, we are seeing record lows now on our strategic oil supply at a time when the reason it was created was in case something like we're fearful could happen in the Middle East happens, that we would have this. But the current administration decided to use that as a short-term fix to try to take some of the pressure off when energy prices were going up and all. But on top of that, but on top of drawing down our needed supply, they basically bashed the oil companies and made them basically say, say to themselves, why do we want to go out and spend all sorts of money on CAMEX on trying to find new supplies, especially when you're telling the world in five or 10 years from now, you're not going to want or even be allowed to have gas and things of that nature. So th that's another added layer to the energy story and why, uh, you know, why I, I concur with Michael that you have to be bullish on the price of oil. Yeah, I actually wanted to follow up, Michael, on your comment on fossil fuels. Um, my portfolio is basically 50% uranium, 50% oil and gas. And that, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but it, it's about that. Um, I'm also very bullish on the energy space. I'm wondering where you generally invest when it comes to oil and gas. Are you looking at pipeline companies? Are you looking at exploration and production? Where do you look at in terms of the market cap range? Um, and and do, you, do you look at the oil tankers as well? Do you look at offshore um, where, where where are you currently investing or, or looking for value there? Historically, Jesse, I've focused on the energy producers and the service companies. I think that's probably where you have the most leverage and you can you can stock pick quite effectively. I think the, the, the tankers and the pipelines are also good derivative plays as well. They typically have a little less leverage to rising prices. The tankers and shippers would. The pipelines are a little more stable, more utility-like uh, businesses. I'd say, you know, I put one caveat on my bullishness on the price of oil. Again, if the war in the Middle East escalates, oil's going to write 150, so those stocks are going to do really, really well. I'd say historically, those stocks have struggled in a slowing economic environment. So I've been a little more cautious over the last six months on that space, just because I don't know what the impact of a recession and how profound that recession may or may not be. Uh, those stocks tend to struggle. But the fact that stocks have held up so well, despite the economic concerns, shows you how tight the physical oil market is and how bullish the backdrop is. Uh, for these names longer term. So you know, we talked a lot of things we talked about, you know, US dollar weakening, rampant deficits, need for real negative rates, de-dollarization. Those are all really bullish for, for all commodities. And the tailwinds that are each feeding these these uh these sector thematics are also quite positive. And the sector is not overowned. Uh either and any of these commodities are not overowned. I'd probably say oil and lithium are probably the two most popular. Uranium are the most popular right now. But that's a tie that's going to raise all these boats and, and have a bit nice backdrop for commodity investors in the next three to 10 years. I'd like to switch back to the broad economy and what seems to be an emerging debt crisis in the U.S. and many countries around the world. Government spending seems to be out of control. Even making the interest payments is going to be a major challenge, let alone ever paying it off, which is just not going to happen. So give us your thoughts on how all of this ends. And Peter, I'll start with you because you've also described a coming retirement crisis you see along with the debt crisis. Um, what are your thoughts on how this is resolved, if if at all? Yeah, well, I think Michael's pretty well covered it, but I'll just say that I like to tell people that what's left of bipartisanship in, in our politicians in America is something called the Congressional Budget Office. And the CBO earlier this year put out a, a prediction, and they had a lot of justification to support it, that in about eight years, we were going to hit $50 trillion in debt. But now, because of the acceleration of the deficit spending, they have talked in some of their recent comments as little as six years. That's within most people's reaches. It's not something like we used to talk 10 or 20 years ago. Yeah, we're going to have a debt crisis, but it, it, it's pretty it's get, it's getting within everybody's time frame. I find seven or eight out of 10 of American families and all from sports athletes I once dealt with to the common working folk. They live at least one lifestyle above where their finances are. And people say, well, how do they do that? Well, they borrow against their future. They either borrow or things that they should be saving for for the future, they use for current lifestyles. This is came at a time when they became very much used to 
simple returns, as Michael said, if you bought bonds, it was kind of hard to, to lose money for almost 40 years. And other than some really sharp corrections or brief hard bear markets, equities did really well. Well, there's still a lot of people living a lifestyle like that's going to continue. And I just, and I, I suspect Michael Kurz is just not in the cards for the future. So with that and with the potential of a, a debt crisis, but the other thing that you touched on, which America still isn't grasping with, is the coming retirement crisis. And that's because we're so involved in day-to-day -day retirement planning. 65% of Americans are working paycheck to paycheck. Sorry, there's just not going to be retirement as the financial service commercial show that you gain this wealth and you live in this beautiful place and you do all these happy things as you grow older. That's not coming. And we're going to have a lot of political issues with that. And one of the big issues, and we've seen it in Canada already, where Michael resides from, is that governments are going to start thinking, well, how do we curtail this? I mean, they literally have suggested to some Canadian seniors who are either struggling strongly financially or uh, with, with illnesses that maybe taking your life is just a good time to exit. And so we're going to have young people start saying down here as we raise the tax base because we're going to have to pay more and more money to, to keep things going. And we're going to have young people turn around and go, why do I want to support a Medicare system where an 85-year-old can go spend a half a million dollars and get a new heart or whatever it may be? And the 85-year-old is going to go, well, you took all the money from your year so I could have this. We're going to have a battle of the ages, certainly in the United States. And I wouldn't be surprised in other Western worlds because of all the financial issues that we just discussed. So I, 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 like I said, when you when you see polls, we have poll after poll here now of seniors 65 and over more worried about running out of money than dying. That's a very sad state of affairs that the don't worry, be happy crowd on Wall Street that sells all these retirement products doesn't dare want to touch. But it's a real issue here. And Michael, maybe we could get your thoughts from a Canadian perspective on on what you're seeing there as well. Uh, when it comes to all of these entitlements uh, that are, you know, people think it's owed to them by the government. They think it's like, well, I paid into it and that automatically means I get to withdraw from it in retirement. But it it doesn't necessarily work that way. Um, how, how do you think this all plays out in the end? Yeah, I think Peter's comment was was brilliant, Jesse. I've been, I've been thinking and saying that for a while. I mean, we've basically funded a lifestyle both at the government level and at the personal family level. I would say two or three notches above the lifestyle that you can afford. The government's probably living five notches above their lifestyle they can afford. And the average American or Canadian family is living one or two notches above where they could afford. And that's been fueled by debt, massive amount of debt expansion for the last 50 years. So you asked the question, Jesse, how does this all end? I think that could be a theme for another one hour webinar we could do in the next month, because it's a big question. It's something we think about every single day at Bash and my partners are talking all the time about how this is end because it has a, ma a massive impact on the stock market. And there's, there's two ways that it ends. And I think the one of them is almost impossible. The first way is you, you have to have a societal contract or everyone has to roll up their sleeves and say, okay, we've been living way above our means at a government level, way above our means at a family level. So we no longer can afford to live like this. So it's going to be 10 years of shared sacrifices. You're, you're selling the cottage you can never afford in the first place. You're not taking that extra vacation you can, you can never afford in the first place. You're not going to go to restaurants five times a week like you do now. You're going to go once a month like my parents used to go. And, and you're basically going to live at your means. But that's going to take a massive amount of sacrifice at the personal level. And a level of sacrifice that no government I've ever seen can do unless they're in full crisis mode, austerity, whatever you want to call it, but reversion to what you can afford, create wealth and use that money to pay down your debt or grow your economy faster than you're accumulating debt. Politically and, and socially, I don't think we have the, the, the stomach as, as individuals, as a society. The government definitely doesn't have the stomach to do that. So I would probably say that's one way you can get out of it, but I, I highly doubt that's the path we're going to choose. The second path we're going to choose, which is a little, a little scarier, and I don't want to be too bearish or too uh, fear-mongering here, is you're going to have to have a debasement of your debt, right? And Ray Dalio, and if you know Ray Dalio, a brilliant thinker, a Bridgewater Associates founder, he talks a lot. He's a big, big picture thinker. He's written many books. He talks about when you live 50 years or 60 years above your means, you, you debt fuel your, your lifestyle for too long as a, as a reserve currency or as a society. You, then you tend to have, at the end, it starts to fray. You start to have civil war or civil conflict, Republican, Democrat, young versus old, uh, geopolitical conflict. You know, uh, Israel, Hamas, Russia, Ukraine, US, China, because really what that ends up being is you've lived above your means for so long. You've got to reset the debt. You've got to rebase the currency or debase the debt. But everyone's fighting over how it's going to get done. And unfortunately, war is a convenient way to do that. If you had a bigger geopolitical conflict, the politicians can say, oh, well, it's too bad we're in World War III. We've got to rebase our currency. We've got to pay back our money in cheaper dollars or massive inflation. 
then you can have 10% inflation. No one's going to be angry at Powell, right? Because you have an excuse. So that's why the, the, the geopolitical conflict that we're seeing right now, yes, it's a function of historical skirmishes, but it's also fueled by I think, a bit of self-interest of these countries saying, well, maybe it's the only path we got it is more conflict or debasement of our debt or massive inflation. Uh, and so that's that's the un uncomfortable ending to the movie. There's a good ending to the movie where everybody kind of sacrifices together, which I doubt we're going to see. The second is a little more uncomfortable and investors have to start positioning themselves for that and, and saying, if that's the end of the movie, how do, how do we protect our financial wealth? How do we protect our families? How to keep ourselves safe in that environment. That's a, a, probably a topic for the next interview we have. Yeah, absolutely. I would definitely love to do a follow-up to discuss that. Well, gentlemen, it's been an honor speaking with you today. Before I do let you go, Peter, tell us about Peter Grandich and company and anywhere else you'd like to direct people online if they want to hear more from you. Well, I found, and I can't call it X. I still say Twitter, uh, where I spend a good part of my time sharing my observations. I also have a YouTube channel and of course I have a blog. Really what's left of my livelihood in the business world is still involved with a planning group that uses an alternative to traditional planning. We focus on cash flow, not chasing net worth. And it's open to US residents only. And I still keep my foot in the metals market. And I wanna say I look very much forward to returning to the conference it was a home away from home for me. I used to be the MC. The Martins do the second, there's second to none conferences that are in all the world that ever went to. And I really appreciate and thank them. And I very much look forward to seeing people that are going to be watching this that will also be attending the conference in January. Well, I will put links to everything you mentioned in the description below. Michael, if you could tell us about uh, Bastion Asset Management and anywhere you'd like to direct people online if they want to hear more from you. Yeah, I mean, Bastion Asset Management is an investment firm. I started with two, two of my former partners. Uh, we're a small cap North American focused fund. Just for your viewers' attention, it's a credit investor only. This is not a solicitation. We do not solicit investors online. We don't look for investors online. Uh, we run money mainly for pensions, high net worth individuals, and accredited investors in Canada only. We don't take any American investors at this point in time and accredited investors only. So I want to be very clear about that. Uh, but it's a small mid cap US focused uh, fund. I'm also heavily involved in the mining space, as you know, a big investor in probably 20 to 25 junior mining companies. Uh, you can find a lot of interviews by me on YouTube, done a bunch with them with Peter, with, with you guys as well. Um, easy to get my thoughts on, on the markets and, and gold and, and commodities on a regular basis on YouTube. Great. Well, I will put links to some of your YouTube videos there as well. Thank you once again for joining us today and sharing your knowledge with the audience and definitely hope to see you at the BRIC. Thank you, Jesse. Thanks, Jesse.